Again, welcome everyone. Uh, we've got some other people joining the line. So I'm gonna get started just to go over a couple of housekeeping items, but uh, welcome to this webinar titled eHealth Balance Exercise Program for Older People and People with Clinical Conditions. Uh, this webinar is facilitated by the Loop of Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Michelle Dukeman and I am the Knowledge Translation Coordinator for the Fall Prevention Program at Parachute. Uh, Parachute now sponsors the Fall Prevention Communities, communities of Practice, Loop, and Loop Jr. along with the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign, which is currently running as it is November. Uh, before we begin, I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, if you have any questions about the technology, uh, please type them into the chat box. My colleague, Elen, uh, will be monitoring this. And if you do have any questions for our presenter about the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A box. They're gonna be answered at the end of the webinar, potentially might look at them midway. We're gonna see how things go, but uh, they'll be addressed definitely at the end of the webinar. Um, you'll only be able to see um, the questions that you have asked and not questions posed by other participants. The webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week along with the presentation slides. You can view previous webinar recordings simply by heading over to the webinar page on Loop and clicking on archived webinars. You can also access archived webinars um, by using the drop down menu um, and going under services and going to archived webinars on the home page of Loop. Oops. Sorry about that. I'm not sure why the color is. Oh, there we go. All righty. So this webinar um, is going to be presented by um, Professor Kim Delbert. Kim is a senior principal research scientist at Neuroscience Research Australia and director of innovation and translation at the Falls Balance and Injury Research Center. For a complete bio on our presenter, please take a look at the Zoom webinar invitation or check out the Loop event calendar. Uh, I wanna thank Kim for joining us. It's, uh, as she's presenting from Australia, it's tomorrow at 8 a.m. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Without further ado, Kim, you can take it away and start sharing your screen. Thanks, Michelle, for the lovely introduction. And yeah, th thank you all for joining um, this, um, this seminar as well. Um, I will say um, it's morning here and it is just about the time that the kids are going to school. My daughter just left, but uh, my son might make some type of appearance. We'll see how we go. Um, I will just share my screen. Um, There we go. Um, I hope you can see it all. If I don't hear anything, um, I will assume it's all okay. Um, so, but I'll, what I will be talking to you about today is um, a program called Standing Tool that we started developing um, or like really started like the first ideas behind it in 2013. Um, so it's been a bit of a journey and I'd like to take you um, through that journey. Um, it is an e-health balance exercise program that we designed with older people, for older people. Um, and we are also branching out um, into clinical um, groups now. Um, so I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, but it's kind of important for the argument. So I would like to start just by kind of setting the scene um, that exercise is the key thing that we need to do to prevent falls. That we know that there's multiple different types of interventions that we can do to prevent falls. But if we have to choose one, if we would have to bet on something, exercise would be our best bet solution. Um, and but it's not just any exercise. There's been some indi indication that walking programs, for example, could potentially increase the risk of falling through exposure. Um, so what we need to do is that we need to ask people to do these moderately to highly challenging balance exercises 
for two hours and some evidence is suggesting three hours, which is a lot of time per week for at least six months and ideally forever. So that's what we know from the evidence. And if we do that, if we do that well, um, we can re reduce the rate of fall, falls between like 20% and 40% roughly, um, depending on the type of challenge that you are able to put into your exercise program. But there's only one problem, and this will come at no surprise to anyone, um, is that the uptake is low. Um, so it's it's not really typically something that people would do um, to prevent falls. And even if in people who do take it up, the sustaining kind of the engagement long term is very poor. Um, and this is something that we see in research studies. So let alone how it would be like in real life um, where there is no commitment um, to the research group who they've been volunteering to. Um, so it is likely that like, people will, will stop. Um, as part of research, we know that about half, over half of the people will stop exercising altogether within a period of 12 months. Um, and then if we look at the adherence um, to the required dose of two, two hours, um, we typically have only in the active kind of weeks and months, we, we typically only sit between 21 and 70 percent. Um, and this is really what started the journey, that problem. So realizing that um, and like we were really looking for um, methods that would make sure that we, we get that long-term adherence um, with our participants and with the older people in the community. So we were looking for more novel methods um, to be able to deliver this high quality exercise program um, to people in the community. Um, and that's when we started to dabble into how could we use technology. Um, we figured that um, technology would really help in an active engagement um, and it would also help um, in the self-management so that we would be able to educate people and really put the onus on themselves um, and make them some, somehow accountable um, for those kind of exercise routines that we would like them to build into their daily life. Um, it will also optimize delivery is what we thought, um, and it will make it easier for people to access the program. There's no need to travel anywhere. It's convenient that you can choose when you would like to do it in your own time. Um, and it also allows that monitoring that you can do continuously through a back end while not actually increasing the cost. So it kind of ticked all the boxes. Um, and so this is just to kind of give you an idea of what standing tall program looks like. Um, so overall, these are just a few screen grabs from the app. Um, you can see, <coughs> apologies, that it is like quite a clean, crisp design with some nice colors that were, um, we did everything through co-design. I will go through that in a minute. Um, so people see this as their first screen and they can choose how many minutes they would like to do. We are not prescriptive in that. The only thing that we like to ask them is to do two hours a week. Um, and then they go they, there is exercises that are provided to them based on their abilities. Um, there is a selection that kind of fills up these minutes that they have selected. So it's meant to be convenient. Um, it's tailored to their ability. We start with a balance assessment um, at the beginning to make sure that they actually everyone starts at that perfectly right level. Um, and then through self-report, we are able to then make sure that it stays motivating um, and, and that it stays at that level that they're at and they're progressing towards. We have a huge amount of exercises. I'm saying 2000 there, but um, there's actually more than 6,000 different variations of exercises. We're, we're not entirely sure how many. It might actually be, be many more than that, um, that are kind of generated through random sequences. And we also give feedback on the progress. So 
This is a paper, um, I'll always kind of put the papers that we have um, available for people to read um, on the side as well. Um, so, but a few years ago, um, this was kind of the premise that we started with. We said, okay, if we are going to use technology, um, what would you like to have in a program if we would like to use technology to deliver exercise, an exercise program to prevent falls? And while none of the things are kind of um, shocking in a way, um, they were very informative for us in the design of the program, just to make so, sure that we were ticking all the boxes. Um, so we had, um, we, we did multiple interviews and we also did focus groups with older people. Um, and so the key things that came out of this qualitative research was that it was important for the program to be accessible to people um, to really reduce those barriers to exercise using technology. So it had to be easy to use. Um, Home-based was definitely a preference. Um, and having um, explicit on-screen step-by-step instructions. So it really had to be intuitive, flawless design. Oh dear, computer is trying to skip through. Um, so flawless design, uh, big buttons, very clear without being condescending. And we really followed all that advice. Um, it was also important. Um, so people felt that they had to benefit from it. So that's kind of fair, isn't it? If you're committing to something, to doing something for two hours a week, um, there has to be a reason for it um, and a benefit to it. But what was interesting that um, obviously they wanted to feel an improvement in physical function um, and also in, in confidence. So um, that reduce in, in fear of falling. So really kind of having that extrinsic motivation to exercise. But what was interesting was that there was quite a strong theme for people to also um, asking for an increase or an improvement in cognitive function. Um, so we, we really set out to make sure that all our exercises were fully evidence-based, um, including balance exercises, functional strength, mobility, and also dual task exercises to have that cognitive focus as well. And then the final one um, is really that it had to be stimulating. Um, physically, mentally challenging, which was really ticking our box as well, offering feedback on performance, progress through the different levels while maintaining it a fun and enjoyable experience. So it was really important that we had to provide a variety of different exercises that are tailored to the individual to make sure that it, the exercises stay challenging yet attainable without it, anyone there. Um, so that's where it became like a real challenge to start and to think like, how can we do this? Um, and it was also important, this is based on evidence as well, that we have a strong inclusion of behavior change um, strategies in there to make sure that we have that long-term engagement. So this is what we started with, um, and that is how we build Standing Tool. Um, so we very much um, like incorporated all those requests. Um, and as we were building it, we had a group of, of consumers who were also guiding us through the developments. Um, they were wonderful in giving us feedback on um, every little and big thing. Um, and we really took that at heart. And I think... Um, having had that process is really key um, to the success of Standing Tall. Um, I will, I'm happy to answer questions on that, like down the track. Um, but um, so that is that is something to keep in mind as the process that happened. So what I would like to talk to you now um, is the, the randomized control trial that we did um, and published in the BMJ. You can see on the right a reference for the protocol paper, and I will show you later the reference for the effectiveness, the main effectiveness paper. Um, so this was a study done in community dwelling people aged 70 and over. Um, Everyone received a baseline assessment after which they were randomized into two groups, an exercise group and a health education group. 
Um, the exercise group received two home visits um, to um, show them how to use the app to make sure that they knew how to set it up. And we also had a second home visit um, to make sure everything was safe. I do want to say we kept this um, like regime with the second home visit, but it wasn't like it, it like after a few, uh, I would say after about 50 people, we realized it was actually not necessary. So people very well knew what to do. These home visits were very quick and we've actually removed them from our next trials because it wasn't necessary to do that. Um, people knew quite well how to use the program. Um, every person in the intervention group was asked to use the program for two hours a week. Um, and everyone was followed up um, for two years. So it was a very long-term study. Um, what we did in the first six months is we followed up with um, the intervention participants who didn't do their exercises. So we would give them a, goal, a call. This was not an onerous job. It was something that we would definitely, that we would plan in um, on a Monday, but it was only a few phone calls a week um, that we would have to do. Um, so, and we would only do that um, for, for six months. And then we followed everyone up um, at six month time intervals um, for a very variety of assessments and falls were monitored on a weekly basis um, through a survey um, that people filled in on their iPad. Important to notice that both groups received an iPad for us, from us, from the study. Um, this study was it started um, in, in 2015, so at that time, iPads were not super common yet. It is rapidly changing, um, but we felt it was important to also give an iPad to the control group to make sure that we controlled for the, the effect of receiving new technology. Um, so... We, the aims of the study were to, to see the effect um, of standing tall um, over a period of 12 months and 24 months on falls. So that was like our primary outcome was a 12 month um, fall rate um, and number of fallers. We also looked at the number of injurious falls and other known fall risk factors, comparing it to a health education control program. Um, Oh, sorry, the health education control program was a program that um, was delivered through weekly fact sheets um, to all participants, to intervention group and control group participants. And these fact sheets were uh, offered information um, on things like how to talk to your GP if you've got a question, um, the importance of staying active. Um, we also discussed various four risk factors. So they were kind of meaningful towards health. Um, following up for two years, that required a lot of fact sheets. Uh, you can do the maths. Um, we did also include a few, you know, um, recipes in there to kind of create that bulk um, of information. Um, so, so here you can see um, the inclusion criteria. So we are we are looking at people who were 70 of age and over. Our older part, oldest participants was 96. Um, and independent in activities of daily living. Um, and we asked them that they were able to walk household distances without a walking aid. Um, but if they were using a walking aid, that it was fine as long as they would say, I'm actually able to walk in my house without, um, if required. Um, and so we excluded people with progressive neurological diseases or unstable conditions, as well as people with dementia um, and people who were currently participating in a fall prevention program. Our sample size was um, 500 as our aim um, to, um, reach that 33% effect is what we were hoping for. Um, here you can see the different questions that we did. We only did the physical test due to budget restraints um, in um, 200, just over 200 people um, whom we followed up at six months and 12 months for those tests. And or everyone was followed up for questionnaires over um, the 24 month period. 
Um, so here you can see um, the health promotion education program. So those were the type of fact sheets that we were giving uh, people through their iPads. So that also encouraged the engagement of the control group with their iPad. And we put in some um, tests of knowledge as well. Um, so one, one thought um, in kind of hindsight is that we were actually potentially um, also offering um, somewhat of an intervention in this group, um, but it is hard to kind of estimate that. Um, so here you can see the participants, um, like the descriptive characteristics of our study sample. Um, so the majority of our people were female, which is yeah, normal in, in older studies, and also um, women tend to volunteer um, more as well, um, but it is relatively balanced. Our average age um, was 77, um, a well-educated group um, with 38% um, reporting a previous fall. Um, the first thing that I would like to discuss with you really is the adherence to the program. Um, so here you can see over the first year um, the, um, how the program was delivered. Um, so you can see that in the first few weeks, like we, we don't start with a two hour program. We, we offer a staggered approach where we start with 40 minutes that can be filled in um, by four to 10 minute sessions. And then we gradually increase uh, by 20 minutes every two weeks until we reach the two hours at nine weeks. And here you can see for the entire sample of the intervention group um, that the median of the adherence um, to the program for that entire sample um, was um, close to 120 minutes for the entire year. And this is something that we're very proud of. Um, we did allow people obviously to take breaks um, if they wanted to over a two year, over a two year period. We felt that that was important. We obviously have people who didn't do their exercises as well, um, but the large majority did. Um, and if you if if we kind of think about it in a slightly different way, um, at six months we still we had eighty percent of the people who were reaching that median of um, close to one hundred and twenty minutes um, a week. So eighty percent that is actually something that I've never seen in any of my trials before using exercise. Um, and that um, at, at one year, that was 68%. Um, so it was still a large proportion of people. And after two years, we still had over half, 52% of people reaching that dose of two hours a week as a median. Um, and if we compare that to other studies that have also used technology, um, like we, we know it is hard to achieve that in any kind of means. Um, but also compared to other technology-based studies, um, we have been able to, um, to, to reach a higher median um, dose on average over a longer period of time, because most of these studies are actually quite short and in small number of people um, than others have achieved. So um, we're really proud of this. Like it's one of those things that we really feel like we've done something right. Um, then if we ask people about barriers to their long-term adherence, like we, we would ask them um, how certain they were that they would be able to continue. Um, and of course, there's challenges. Um, like there's, there's always reasons why people can't do their exercises um, for, um, you know, every week. Um, one of the things that we noticed, this was well before pro COVID time, of course, but our older people, our participants were quite busy. So um, there would be lots of traveling. Some people would take their iPads with them, but not everyone. Um, and then, of course, sometimes we've got a bit of a lull in our motivation um, or um, there's issues related to health, which is, of course, very common. Uh, but by allowing that break, um, people often did take it up again after that. Um, so it kind of um, took that pressure off um, and increased that overall adherence. If we um, now look at the user experience and the enjoyment to the program, 
um, the, the, the user experience was, was actually very high and um, that people were rating the program as excellent, um, which like, it, it would have to be for a person to use it for that long time. Um, and that they really felt it was user friendly, um, that they could see themselves continuing the program um, for a long period of time um, uh, to, to exercise and to practice their balance. So overall, this was very a very positive experience. Um, people, these are things that people would say um, as what how it had benefited um, them. So. Um, the large majority would say that they'd, it had benefited them. It, it would have been uh, would have given them confidence uh, in regards to their walking, uh, improving their balance. And but my absolute favourite is is things that you can see here in the bottom um, in the in the green box and the bottom um, blue box is that this was very common that people would say I actually built it into my routine. Um, and it helped me to make a habit out of this. And this was really key. Um, and we saw that the people who, who did continue for two years had actually managed to make a habit out of um, doing two hours of balance exercises a week. Um, these are also some um, um, quotes from people and is based on a, a qualitative paper that was also published, I think it was on previous paper somewhere oh no it's at the start sorry it's here um so this paper was recently um published um and so we we did see a few themes in there um and like one of the key things was that people really appreciated the flexibility of standing tall that they could do it at home at their own time um, they enjoyed the program, like this person would say, like, can't believe it, but I've actually done this for a year and I enjoy it. Um, so, so that's very nice to hear, of course. Um, it improved overall physical awareness and confidence um, so that people would feel less worried about falling. Um, and um, people also felt quite confident um, and positive about how the exercises were delivered through instructions and video demonstrations. Um, and this person actually said that she felt like she was just in a class with, um, with the instructor. Um, so overall, I think we followed our, our scope that we received from our older people at the beginning um, and achieved um, a successful outcome. So, but now of course, um, what we all wanna know about, did it actually work? Um, so our primary outcome analysis, as I mentioned before, was the number of falls um, in the first year. So that was our primary outcome um, and the status um, of falls as well. Um, and we did some additional anal an analysis. I won't bore you with the details, like just to make sure um, if there was an effect on people using the program more or less. Um, so those type of analysis as well. Important to note is that everything was intention to treat. So if people dropped off the exercises, um, that was um, all, they were all just allocated through their own group as they, where they started in the beginning. Um, and the analysis were um, unadjusted for the primary outcome measures and adjusted for baseline scores for all the others. So here you can see um, the primary and the secondary re results in relate to falls. Um, this paper um, was published in the BMJ um, earlier this year in, in April 2021. You can see the reference here. Um, and you can see from this um, graph or, or picture, um, so the bolded text, the bolded items are our primary outcomes. So that's the rate of falls at 12 months and the proportion of people who fell at 12 months. And you can see that, um, I'm not sure if you can see my computer mouse, but um, so you can see that the, the confidence interval crosses one. Um, for both of those, so which means that we didn't um, reach significance for our primary outcome measure. So you can see the numbers on the side as well. Um, so for the rate of falls, we reduced falls by 18%, but we just missed out on significance. 
and the same for the proportion of falls where we reduced by 10% and there we um, it was more than, than just uh, missing out, like we actually miss, really missed out on that one. But what is important to see, um, and we're very proud of this result, of course, is that because we had that really long-term um, adherence to the program, um, we actually reduced the rate of falls at two years uh, by 16%. And importantly, we also reduced the rate of injurious falls as well. So we had less injuries from falls also at two years by 20%. Um, and so this is um, really kind of showing how that long-term adherence, making it a habit, will make a difference to people, to people's life long-term. Um, we also um, assessed secondary outcome measures. I'm just showing a few. Um, so we had an overall improvement in balance, um, being a balanced exercise program, and um, we also increased and improved quality of life at six months. Um, this is very hot from the press. This paper is currently being um, considered in a journal, um, but we are also we also did a cost effectiveness analysis um, at the participant level. Um, and here you can see in this graph that we um, it is in Australian dollars, apologies, um, but that the program was value for money. Um, so I'll just show all of the graphs here now. So, but you can see um, that the incremental cost effectiveness ratio for standing tool as we delivered it in this first trial was um, $4,785. Um, if we compare this to other home-based exercise programs, um, this is based on a study that was published also in Australia in 2012. Um, we can see that our offering is, is less costly. Um, and we have also done an analysis where we replaced the home visits with telehealth, which is how we are running our studies now, thanks to COVID. Um, and so that would reduce um, that ratio even further. Um, so just kind of um, giving you a bit of an idea of what we're doing now um, and where we are looking um, to kind of take um, this program next. Um, I will talk to you a little bit about studies that we have already completed um, or are in the process of completing and also future studies that we're still um, conducting. Um, so this particular study was done by my collaborator, Michelle Kalasaya. Um, you can see the reference here was published also this year, um, where we had a group of 93 people with mild cognitive impairment um, who were um, in a six month study um, where we um, also offered standing tool with a strong kind of dual task training program added to it. Um, and um, so in this group of people, the adherence was again, absolutely fantastic. Um, with 85% of the people using the exercise program at, like for the entire six month uh, project um, at the required dose um, with high usability, no adverse events. Um, and you can see here that um, there was an overall improvement in gait speed in the intervention group compared to the control group um, after this six month study. Um, we also conducted a feasibility study in 15 people with dementia. Um, the main reason behind doing this study, you can see the reference here, it was published last year. Um, was really to see if we would be able to um, offer this program to people with dementia. The re requirement was that they had a carer living in their home. So this was not looking at effectiveness at all, but really just usability. Um, and overall, um, it was very positive. Like you can see here, um, the rate of adherence that people had to the program. Um, we only had that kind of smaller dose um, for them. 
Um, and um, so that overall, like people adhered quite well. Um, and what we what we know, we are actually um, analyzing um, the qualitative interviews as well. Um, but we had very positive feedback from the carers as well, where they very much appreciated that they had a program at hand that was giving a meaningful activity for their older person with dementia. Um, and um, so that was very well received and the people with dementia also very much enjoyed using the program. Um, the carer didn't have to be there to press the buttons for them. Uh, so once they were set up, um, everyone was able to use the program on their own. So that is also credit to the usability of the program. It is intuitive. Um, so now I will also I will speak to programs or, or studies that we are running now um, and are in the process of completing. Um, so we are reevaluating standing tall in another trial um, in 518 people, community dwelling people again, at a higher risk of falling, where we are also adding a dual task training to improve that cognitive function. Um, and it is a tailored program. So we are assessing people at the start based on their balance abilities, based on their cognition, so executive function, um, and also based on their mood. Um, and based on that, score and based on that assessment we offered them a slightly different program we would give them a higher dose of balance exercises or we would give them cognitive behavioral therapy in addition to that or a stronger dose of that dual task training um, so so that is really um, so what we did as part of this study um, we have well and truly finished recruitment. We finished recruitment in uh, December last year. Um, of note, um, so we kept going um, during COVID, but we switched all our processes to telehealth, which has been going quite well. Um, just as an indication, we recruited, we were just about halfway um, when um, COVID hit. Um, and we recruited our remaining participants in less than six months. So, um, and we also were in lockdown at the time. So we, we definitely had the appetite from the older people to participate in an online program. Um, and so we will be looking at doing the analysis hopefully in February. So um, watch this space, I would say. Um, and then what we are also doing um, is we are looking to see or to learn um, from a, an implementation trial where we are asking um, health professionals to deliver the setup for standing tall um, as part of their services. Um, we are running this trial in Australia and in the UK. We have completed the Australian trial. We are um, running the analysis of that um, site um, now. So that it, it was um, in New South Wales and also in Victoria across different sites um, where we were looking at the uptake and the adherence in the real world and how it is adopted by health professionals. Um, and we're really looking to identify those factors that we need to embed into front end and back end of the app to facilitate this. Um, in the UK, we're still running for another six months um, for obvious reasons related to COVID. Um, so we will then um, run that analysis separately um, and then obviously combine them together um, in the same paper. All, all the sites use identical methods. Um, we are also running another trial called Own Your Balance, um, which is a three-arm um, parallel RCT where we're really um, using Standing Tall in addition with the Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Program um, in collaboration with Black Dog um, to improve well-being, but also to reduce fear of falling. So that is in a group of people with fear of falling, and our primary aim is to reduce um, fear of falling. Um, we are also adding um, a motivational interviewing um, steps in there to encourage people to be more active. Um, it is it's a short and snappy intervention of eight weeks. Um, and um, so one arm uh, will receive standing tall in addition to this cognitive behavioral therapy program, um, and one arm doesn't. 
um, people are welcome to keep using standing tall for as long as we like, but, as they like, but they don't, they are not being followed up for that. Um, so, and the question here is really to see does standing tall offer that additional kind of push um, to reduce that fear of falling, which we know is, is so important and prominent in older people. And then the final study that I just wanted to mention is very exciting. We have just started this week, so it's it's a it's a very fresh study um, where standing tool is a key component in a stroke trial. So where standing tool will be offered as part of the stroke rehabilitation um, in a planned sample of eight hundred people. Um, there, it is part of a, of a bigger technology-based program where there is extensive monitoring of the participants as well for uh, blood pressure, um, activity monitoring, heart rate, medication, and so on. But so standing tall is the core exercise component. So just as a final kind of wrap up before um, we move into questions, and I really welcome um, a discussion if we can have one, um, is that so overall we've been able to show in our first trial that we, um, we can prevent falls um, and we can prevent injurious falls by 20% over a period of two years. We had high levels of adherence um, the program is unsupervised, so that's like really important to realize. In our first trial, we only had two home visits. In our current trial, we have zero home visits, but one telehealth visit. Um, and so we were reaching that high level of adherence of 85%. In the, that's in the MCI study. It was 80% in our own study, 68% um, after 12 months and 52% after 24 months, still reaching that median dose of two hours a week, which is unprecedented. We had low attrition rates and overall we considered it safe. Um, in our two year follow-up trial, we did have four falls of people reporting that while they were doing standing tall, but we had a look at other exercise related falls and within our sample, there were 37 other. So we feel it's um, it's definitely not a concern to have in this large group of people. Um, and in relation to technology acceptance, um, like one thing I feel increasingly passionate about really is that we we really need to understand that a technology is is here. It's here to stay, as we know, but it's also something that is acceptable to all the people. Um, and it is something that we really can encourage um, and um, is increasingly acceptable and COVID will help even more. Um, the user experience was very positive and encouraging. Um, technology use in all the people is rapidly increasing. Like we can see it from our studies um, where we, our initial surveys um, suggested that about one quarter of the people had Wi-Fi internet at home um, when we started um, this study in 2014. And now it would be one quarter that doesn't have internet at home. So Wi-Fi at home. Um, so, so those kind of, it's, it's rapidly increasing. Um, and yeah, we feel that there's exciting applications in other areas, you know, as we are venturing down into stroke rehab um, it is very encouraging. I'll just put my email address here as well for any additional questions. Um, but I also um, want to mention that couldn't have done this uh, whole program without the support of my team um, and my collaborators. So it is it's very much a team effort. Um, and also credit, credit to our, our main funding organization, which is the National Health and Medical Research Council. Thanks, Michelle. I will leave it there. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. 
I'm just going to start sharing my screen. I've got a couple few housekeeping items um, while the last couple of questions trickle in. Um, I want to thank you, Kim, for such a wonderful presentation and for sharing your extension, extensive knowledge of this development, evaluation, and implementation of um, this really novel approach to fall prevention. So we have had a few participants submit their questions um, in the Q&A. Um, so we'll address those momentarily. First, uh, I'll uh, just take us through a couple of slides for, for folks who um, may not already be members of the fall prevention community of practice loop. Um, it's, uh, it's at no cost and, and please feel free to sign up. Uh, it's where you'll get the most up-to-date information on our upcoming webinars. Um, and I just wanna make sure that folks um, feel encouraged to fill out the feedback survey that will pop up um, once the webinar ends. Um, if you click the blue continue button on your browser, you'll be redirected to the survey. We really would appreciate if you could provide feedback so we can continue to offer um, these high quality webinars like the one we just experienced. Um, and if you're not already a Loop member, please feel free to join. Um, there are some links to join at the top of the chat box. Um, thank you again, Kim, and uh, I can walk us through some of the questions that uh, have appeared in our chat box. Um, so the first one is, uh, do you know if participants did other exercises, for example, aerobic or strength training in addition to the balance exercises? Um, yeah, thanks, Avril, uh, for that question. Um, so we we did ask about that. We haven't properly kind of evaluated it. We do have that information, um, but as part of our first trial, what we what we um, we it's an indication. It wasn't significantly um, different, uh, but that people um, they committed to the standing tall program, which included balance. It includes strength, um, functional strength, I would say, um, and mobility as well. Um, and that that was like really the core part of their exercise regime. Um, and uh, so they didn't necessarily add in um, other kind of group-based exercise programs um, to, to, to that regime. Um, some people would go out for walks, so that was definitely something that people um, still did, um, but it seemed to have replaced most of that kind of planned other exercise. Um, I hope that's answering your question. It is something that in the next trials, we're really trying to encourage, especially in the fear of falling one, um, where we're really trying to encourage people to be active overall. Our intention really is not that standing tall is everything. Um, like it really needs to be this program um, that builds people's confidence and kind of in make sure that their balance is, is, is right um, so that they can take on other activities as well, such as aerobic and strength training um, and other kind of um, more um, social activities as well, which was definitely done. Um, but um, not necessarily as part really of, of uh, structured exercises. So in our future development, we are looking to actually add that element in there a little bit more strongly as well to make sure that we offer a more holistic exercise program. Great, thank you. And so uh, another question uh, in the Q&A box is, um, would the exercises be of benefit uh, to those who are post rehabilitation patients upon discharge home? Yeah, thanks, Suzetta. Um, so um, we hope so. We actually have submitted um, a grant application to look at this, um, and we actually we hope that we will be able to um, improve the transition of care um, through a program like Standing Tool. Um, so what we are envisaging is that people would be able to use that as part of the their in rehab um, kind of programs, like as a component of their in rehab programs and that they would then be able to take um, standing tall home with them to offer that continuity of training. Um, what the back end of standing tall really offers is, is um, 
it, it allows um, a therapist, a clinician, um, you know, anyone really to, to really have a look um, at what their patient, their client is doing and how they are progressing through the different levels. Um, if they're struggling with any exercises, like it is all very kind of informative from that point of view. Um, so it can be used as a monitoring kind of service, especially if people are living a bit further away, uh, but it can also be used when you're checking in with your patient through telehealth or um, when you're seeing them face to face to really kind of then tune um, your own therapy sessions to make sure that you actually give them those additional exercises as well. Um, so it's it's kind of one of those things that you can use it both for to to inform your own therapy as well as giving that program to people for that high dose of exercise, which you know is essential. It's essential for falls, um, but it's essential for post um, um, rehab as well. Great. Um, and next question is from Catherine. Um, I wanted to thank you for sharing the program with us. Um, and that you mentioned earlier in your talk, the, the evidence that suggests that three hours of balance exercise in a week is more effective. Have you considered incorporating the three hour recommendation into your trials to see if it can be achieved and with what effects? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. We actually did. Um, so when that evidence came out um, um, in the Cochrane Review and uh, Kathy Sherrington's follow-up paper as well, um, like we, we definitely really considered it. Um, and in our trial that we are due to finish and we'll do the analysis in February, um, we, we are offering a, a tailored delivery. Um, and so I mentioned that we are tailoring it based on mood and, and cognitive function, but we are actually also tailoring it based on their balance abilities. Um, so people would either receive two hours or three hours. So if their balance is poorer, um, we would advise them to, to try and get that to that higher dose. So that is how we have implemented into our program. Um, you know, as you know, because we're still um, finalizing the data collection, I haven't looked at the data. Um, so it is something that we will um, be able to um, answer as a question uh, very soon, though, in a few months months um but um so yes the sh short answer to your question is we did think about it and we have incorporated it and we'll let you know how it goes great Alrighty, and there is a question that uh, found its way into the chat box rather than Q&A, so uh, I'll uh, relay that one. Um, Deborah asks if you could speak a bit more about the issues with walking um, as an exercise option vis-a-vis -vis falls. Um, she found that was uh, quite informative. Yes, um, of course, uh, Deborah. Thanks for that question. Um, so this is um, it's largely largely based on um, systematic review evidence. So um, there have been quite a few studies um, that have looked at different exercise options. Like when I started the presentation, where I said exercise is the best bet kind of solution. Um, we it's through those systematic reviews that we also know it's not just any exercise. Um, and one of those um, programs that is often chosen by many older people as their kind of favorite exercise um, is walking. And it is definitely one that we want to keep recommending um, because it is so good for so many things. Um, but what we have also seen um, through these reviews and these meta-analysis analysis is that if we are just focusing on a walking program, um, for example, you would see that as part of cardiac rehab, for example, um, if, you, if you are just offering a walking program as part of that in a frailer group of people, you are um, it, it is possible that you are increasing the risk of falling, which is actually due to exposure. Um, so if you don't match that up with balance exercises, so that's really the take home message um, that you should, in addition to a walking program, should also give some uh, good challenging um, balance exercises as well um, to make sure that people can go for walks and long walks outside uh, and it doesn't increase their risk of falling. I hope that's answering your question, Deborah. So, but that's really the key issue. It's good for people 
but we need to make sure that we also match it up with balance exercises so we we give them the ability um to to walk well and walk um safe um and not increase their risk of falling through exposure i'm not sure i understand oh. well siri didn't understand but i hope you did <laughs> sorry <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's great. Um, all righty. Yes, Deborah confirms that that does. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. No one doesn't answer series. <laughs> uh, all righty. So it yes. doesn't look like we've got any other questions in the chat box. Um, so I just want to say thank you again, Kim. Um, that was a, a fantastic presentation, um, getting lots of uh, thank yous in the chat box and a lot of people have appreciated um, uh, this presentation and are really going to take uh, a lot of things away from it. So thank you again. Um, I'll say have a wonderful evening to everyone who's joining us from Canada and I'll say have a wonderful day, Kim. Uh, and thank, thank you. you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody.